the this parasitic other financialized economy that's feeding off the main economy and just sucking the money out. So there's never enough money in the in the real economy to pay for goods and services. You don't need to force austerity on people who didn't do it, who weren't liable for, you know, the, who weren't at fault, which is what we tend to do because we pretend like that money actually is owed to somebody, but it's not. It was created as credit on the books. It could be written off. The globalists want to own everything and they're getting very close to doing it. They want an independent system that's not controlled by government. Innovation, disruption, and big issues. This is Business Game Changers with Sarah Westall. Westall. Game Changers, I'm Sarah Westall. Today we have one of the smartest people in economics coming and talking to us. Her name is Ellen Brown, and she was, she's an author. She's written over 10 books. She's written the national bestseller, Web of Debt, which has sold more books than almost any economic book out there. She is an amazing person, and we're going to be talking a lot about, well, we're going to talk to her about the economy. We're going to talk to her about public banking, cryptocurrencies. She looks at things differently, and she's extremely bright. I think a lot of people don't quite understand where she's coming from or why she's saying stuff, so I'm hoping... I um, was able to get her to, to open that up for people so that they understand more her perspective. Uh, a lot of people, when they're talking about cryptocurrencies or banking or whatever, they just shoot at the hip and they're not saying things that are necessarily grounded in economics. And I think she's coming at it from a different perspective, but very grounded. And she likes public banking. And I know a lot of people don't like the idea of public banking because our government's involved. But she she wants you to understand that our government's going to be involved anyway. So how do we keep our government involved in a way that's that maximizes the money coming to the people? That's her concept. So we also get into the debt, and we get into black money. Where is that debt? Can we get it back? Lots of things that we talk about. So I hope you stick around for this whole interview, and let's welcome Ellen Brown to the show. Hi, Ellen. Welcome back to the program. Hi, Sarah. Great to be talking to you. Yeah, I've been wanting to talk to you for a while about the economy and the things that you're doing. I wanted to pick your brain on it. But let's get started. Let's dive right into it. Is the economy, if not fundamentally restructured, doomed to collapse? No. First of all, the deep state has $40 trillion in black money, according to Catherine Austin Fitz which means that they can tra- they can collapse it if they want to, and they can keep it up if they want to. It's just a question of not being an insider. I can't tell you whether it's going to collapse or not, but it's not doomed to collapse. We have a $21 trillion, nearly $21 trillion debt, but we also have a nearly $21 trillion M3 money supply. Our debt is our money supply. In other words, people think that money is a thing that just – comes into existence it stays there forever like gold or coins or something but it's not virtually all of our money is credit and debt that's what it is it's bank credit and if you've got a credits on one side you've got to have a debt on the other side i mean it's just a balance sheet thing there's nothing wrong with our 21 trillion dollar debt except for the interest that we pay on it and that keeps going up and therefore we keep you know, having a debt ceiling problem, and then you have to have Congress vote on the debt, et cetera. But it's actually good to have the money supply expand. And that means the debt expanding. And the reason is that, um, well, it has to do with social credit. I don't know. If, anyway, the, the whole the thing is, you've got a GDP that you need to have the money out there to buy. You need enough money to buy the goods and services that the people make. And a lot of money doesn't go into goods and services. People don't spend all the money that they make even, let alone the, this parasitic other financialized economy that's feeding off the main economy and just sucking the money out. So there's never enough money in the, in the real economy to pay for goods and services. So the, the very things that we make, in other words, we make those for ourselves, supposedly, but we don't. We, the people, the wage earners, don't have enough money to pay for them. So you need to get some extra money out there, one way or another. So it's not so bad that the money supply is expanding. Okay, well, 
like you said, the debt is is okay because that's how we. But should we be paying interest on that debt if the government was issuing its own money? We didn't have a third party doing it. Would we need to be paying any interest? Uh, a very good point. No, I don't think we need to pay interest. I mean, we should borrow it directly. I mean, if you want to borrow, for some reason, the government's more com comfortable borrowing than issuing. They think issuing it would be inflationary, although it wouldn't actually. But I mean, I could show that by numbers. But anyway, let's say they want to borrow it. They can borrow it directly from the Federal Reserve, which is their bank, of course, which creates the money out of nothing. And and the Fed re rebates its profits to the government. So in other words, the interest goes back to the government. Of course, they take a little out for their fees or, you know, to pay their staff or whatever. But basically, if we actually funded it all through our own central bank, which is something that we did do historically, and then, uh, you know, in the 1930s, the, the banks insisted that we not do that directly. And so we had to go through this whole, these, you know, these 22 special banks that are allowed to buy the government's debt and then they sell it on. In other words, we have to go through the open market and sell it to whatever investors, but we could be, be borrowing directly from our own central bank. The uh, Federal Reserve, contains a big chunk of our federal debt already. And so but and, and so we can just overnight say we're done. We're not going to do it like this anymore and we're going to do it like this and then that debt or that interest that we have been spending can then be used on us, the people, the infrastructure, things that we need to survive. Exactly. We pay something like 400 billion dollars annually in interest on the federal debt. Okay, I'm sure I think I've got my numbers now. Okay, 4.5 trillion is how much is um, that the Federal Reserve has, of which 3.7 trillion was quantitative easing, and I think to, uh, more than half of that. I think 2.7 trillion is uh, the federal uh, federal securities, and the rest is more mortgage-backed securities. Okay, so. Now, let's talk about this black budget that you're talking about, the black money, because overnight we could take care of that debt. We could stop borrowing from other banks. Why would we? Even, I want to talk about why we would borrow other than enriching people with power. I want to talk if there's any political need to do that. But overnight we could pay off that debt with the black money that's ours, and we could um, recoup the interest payments that we're paying now by issuing our own money and get to the private banking system that you're talking about or the government public banking system that you're talking about. Right. Or as Catherine Austin Fitz points out, um, that we've got a $21 trillion debt before you call it a debt. You've got a balance. You've got to look at your balance sheet and there's 21 trillion that they've already documented in undocumented adjustments just from the um, military and HUD, which was where she used to work. So so this is undocumented adjustments means money they didn't account for. In other words, they've stolen the money. So if we even just get that money back on the balance sheet, then we don't have any debt at all. It's, you know, we can pay ourselves off. We can pay that debt off. Well, yeah, we stole it though? Money. But who stole it and do we have the money and is it recoverable? Well, that's a good question. So it's the military and who are the military? And of course, I saw somebody said recently that um, maybe it was <laughs> when I was watching it, one of your interviews, I forget, that said that, uh, that the president won't even have clearance to know, I, I mean, won't even have clearance to see into all these things until like two years into his presidency. So who knows? what secrets are buried. It seems to me we shouldn't have any secrets. I mean, this whole idea exactly. about military secrets, we don't even need need that. It should all be transparent. If we had total transparency for what's going on in our government, we could trust our government because we could sue when they're violating the Constitution or whatever. It's big farce right now. We can't even fix things because we don't even know what's going on half the time because exactly. it's all top secret. And so now it, all they do is make things they mess up top secret or things they want to hide top secret. And we already know, according to Bill Binney and others, that NSA is not doing what they should be doing as far as keeping people safe. We could keep all these terror attacks 
uh, you know, we could keep stop them. They're probably false flags. But we could stop them, even the internal false flags or anything like that, we could stop from happening if they would use the tools in which they were intended to be used for and not be uh, going against our constitutional, constitutional private rights. Yeah, I agree. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. Well, now that we agreed on that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so many things we could fix if we were up there with the power to fix them. We know it can be done. So, in other words, the economy does not have to collapse. We can fix the economy. And if we had, or if, if Trump is like Roosevelt, although it seems to me he's totally surrounded and he doesn't seem to have the freedom he we would we're hoping he might have to actually pull off some of the things he said he would do but he could change the whole system and you know just like pay off the debt for example um roosevelt said well we're stuck with the reason we've got a problem is we don't have enough gold so we're just going to go off the gold system well that was like totally unheard of people were saying well you can't do that and he did it and in other words, there every well, I've just written about this. Every 20 or 30 years, we have changed the monetary system. We can and we will change it again. We know we will. That's what the Federal Reserve did in 2008. They said, okay, here's what we're going to do. And they started just lending free money to the banks, which they hadn't done before, and called it quantitative easing and bought toxic assets off the banks, which I think is perfectly good. Much better to have the central bank buy these toxic assets and, you know, basically put them back to zero. I mean, well, it's a long story, but um, the thing I write about all the time is where does our money come from? Our money is actually created by banks when they make loans. So if we're talking about bank loans that go bad, this is what the Chinese do. They know that they just issued that money. They, they just issued credit. They, that's what they did when they were actually communist. So they switched over and pretended to balance their books when they had to join the World Trade Organization and they were required to balance their books. But they still just, if they have some bad loans, they just write them off because nobody's hurt. Nobody actually put up the money. The money was just created as an accounting entry. So you can write off those accounting entries if you need to, to save your economy. You don't need to force austerity on people who didn't do it, who weren't liable for, you know, the, who weren't at fault, which is what we tend to do because we pretend like that money actually is owed to somebody, but it's not. It was created as credit on the books. It can be written off. So then why are we doing that? Why are we making this big pretend austerity deal? Well, I think to force um, governments to privatize, that, you, that the whoever, the globalists, versus, let's call it the globalists versus the nationalists, as people have characterized it. The globalists want to own everything, and they're getting very close to doing it. They want an independent system that's not controlled by government. That So what they want to do is buy up everything the government currently owns, which is us. I mean, everything the people currently own collectively, they want to buy it up, they want to own it, and they want to rent it back to us. And they're doing a pretty good job. They've bought up an amazing amount of stuff now, like Detroit. <laughs> I mean, that's what they want to do. They want to put cities into bankruptcy. They don't want cities to get cheap credit. I mean, banks can get cheap credit fine because they are the banks, but they they could just as easily have given cities 0% loans, just like they gave the banks 0% loans, but they did, wouldn't do it because they say it's not in their mandate. Well, that's true, but Congress could change the mandate. I mean, the mandate just came from Congress. But Congress won't do it because they, too, are big business, controlled by big business, controlled by big business interests, and they want to privatize everything. Well, how many people actually understand it that's up in Congress? I mean, isn't that part of the problem, too? It's a huge part of the problem, but also I think they're controlled. I think you've got three things going on. A, that, that you know, the totally clean ones that they can't get anything on don't understand the system. And then there are people who... They have control files on because, you know, they've managed to cap capture, take pictures of them doing something that they shouldn't have been doing or whatever. And three, they, they need the money from uh, for their campaigns. And so they do whatever their big investors want. So we have to, the first thing we have to do is get rid of that. We have to set up a system somehow that you don't need big money in order to to win you should win because you're you're actually the most qualified but 
I don't know. I don't know when that's ever going to happen. <laughs> okay, so the the Federal Reserve. A lot of people are really, really dislike the Federal Reserve because we can't audit it. We have no idea what's going on. It feels like it's a private institution, and people yeah, say well, it's a private institution. So, and, but you're saying it's our bank. So, can you explain what it really is? Uh, well, it is uh, composed of twelve branches, all of which are hundred percent owned by the banks in their districts. And so, in that sense, it is definitely a private institution, and the. The, the biggest and the one that calls the shots is the New York Federal Reserve, which is obviously where all the Wall Street banks are. So the Wall Street banks are calling the shots and the Fed's first duty is to protect the banks and keep that system going. Um, I'm just saying it's a tool that we could use that could be used for our benefit. It's not necessarily right now. It's under the control of other interests. But it's there, and there's no reason that the economy has to collapse. We can use the tools we have if we had an enlightened Congress or whatever, an enlightened bedhead or some somebody who who actually wanted to put those tools to use. And they have put those tools to use. I mean, I thought it was a good thing that they bought up federal securities because it's the cheapest way for us, the people, to fund government instead of having to be you know, the, sell it all off to the Chinese and then we're beholden to the Chinese and then we start worrying about whether the Chinese are going to buy our debt or whether they're going to dump our debt. It doesn't matter if the Chinese dump our debt. Everything they dump are the, either the Federal Reserve will buy or we can we actually force those 22 banks to buy, buy the debt. I mean, they don't really have a choice but to buy the debt and they buy it quite cheaply and then they on lend it. Okay, well, now... The Federal Reserve can't or is never audited. Don't you think that's a major issue that we, at least the president, at least a certain banking committee, somebody that is elected should have the right, should have the right to monitor what the Fed's doing? Yeah. And there's talk about that. And one hopes that maybe this administration will manage to pull that off. I mean, there are many things we're hopeful that this administration might be able to do that they have said, or Trump has said he would do, but he does seem to be pretty much blocked at the moment by whatever, captured by the deep state, I guess. Who knows? I think they take him into a little room and they get elected and show him a picture of the video, uh, the video of the Kennedy assassination, and that's pretty much the end of it. <laughs> so. You don't do what we want. This is what's going to happen to you. Okay, or well... Do it. They have to do it very low key, which is what we hope is happening. We hope things are happening behind the scenes, like those two hundred indictments that nobody knows exactly what's happening there. But eight hundred and fifty-two at this point. Oh, eight hundred fifty-two. Wow, it's growing very quickly. Yeah. Um, let's get into what you're really an advocate of. You are an advocate for public banks. Um, people. And people have witnessed unbelievable corruption by the government. And I know I already asked some of this, but I want you to really dive into this. They're weary of the government being involved at all in anything because of the deep state and how they only care. It seems that they only care about themselves. We don't have people that are elected that care about the country. Would a public banking solution be inviting more government and corruption? I mean, how do we keep it for the people, by the people? Well, we have one, one only state-owned bank, and that is the Bank of North Dakota, and they are not corrupt. They are very good for the local economy. Everybody there loves them. The, the local bankers love them because they partner with the local banks, so they're basically like a banker's bank. But what they do is keep their money in the state for their own purposes. And once you understand how banking works, you can either take your money as a loan fund and lend it out once, you know, say you've got a billion dollars, you lend it out at 3%, wait for it to come back and then lend it again. Or you can take that billion dollars, make it the capital of a bank and you can lend it 10 times over. So technically you can make 30%. Of course, really, you've got to pay for your liquidity. So you're probably going to pay 1% on your deposits. But overall, it works out to about you can make five times as much on your money if you use it as capital for a bank <clears throat> as if you 
lend it out directly. And all local governments already have these loan funds. So basically what we're talking about here is just a more efficient way to use your money. Instead of sending it off to Wall Street where they are going to do this, m multiply it many times over and use it for their purposes, which may actually even hurt your estate, you're going to do that yourself. You'll have control over who gets the credit, on what terms, etc. And in order to prevent corruption, you just bake that into your charter. You say you can do this, this, and this. You hire basically civil servants. There's no bonuses, fees, commissions. There's no motivation to gamble and speculate because you're not going to make any more money off it. Your job depends on doing a good job according to whatever these parameters that you're given, which are basically serving serving the public interest. If you don't do that, you get fired. So, so why, you know. what's keeping us from doing that? We have this shining example in North Dakota. Why are people not able to replicate it? Any state at this point, even though North Dakota is thriving under that system compared to other states? Well, I think, again, it's a matter of not understanding how the system works. Most people think that banks take in money and lend it out again. And then they say, well, it's going to be risky for the government. Government can't do anything right. Um, it'll be corrupt, et cetera. The government will be influencing it. But that's not what we're talking about. So first of all, you just have to understand the model and why you're better off using your own money for your own purposes than sending it off to Wall Street and letting them do it and letting them take huge fees. And we all know how corrupt Wall Street is. But we have a lot more interest now. I mean, we have, well, Santa Fe has probably gotten the farthest. They've finished their feasibility study. They've determined that even this little city of Santa Fe can turn a profit within a year just by refinancing their own debt. In other words, it's a cheaper way to finance your own debt, your own city debt, than to send it, than to do a bond issue and pay all this money to the the bond, you know, the banks for the bond. And we've got uh, Washington State has a feasibility study that they're doing. Um, New Jersey just elected a governor, Phil Murphy, who is uh, had he was a Goldman Sachs banker, and that's why he understands what we're talking about. I mean, he understands the potential. And so he immediately got it as soon as he heard this idea. And he, and he took it and run with it, ran with it, and that is the funding basis of his platform. That's how he's going to fund all the things he promised in his platform. So we're very So he hopeful. can actually do something. Well, now, people are starting to understand that the bonds that are being issued that are going through Wall Street – has been corrupted. There's a lot of examples of corruption and cities being taken advantage of. So do you think more people are opened up to your idea of not using Wall Street because of the all the examples of people being swindled? Yeah. Well, and you have a number of cities that have actually um, passed a uh, resolution saying they're not going to put their money in Wells Fargo, for example, which blatantly created these two million uh, bank accounts that were fraudulent. But then, so if you pull all your money out of Wells Fargo, where do you put it? That You put it in another Wall Street bank that also has a litany of felonies or what would be felonies if anybody else did it. Uh, the local banks really don't want any more of those deposits than they have because they have to collateralize them at 110%. It's a long story. But anyway, they can't really use them. So, so it's sort of a natural fit. If you're gonna if you're gonna divest from Wells Fargo or divest from Wall Street, where do you put your money? Set up your own bank. It's a much more efficient way to do it than any other option. And so we're getting more and more politicians that are starting to see this. More and more people that are going, okay, this is a smart way to go. How close are we to seeing a city being set up that that way? Uh, well, Phil Murphy's liable to be the first in New Jersey just because you know, he's got the political will. If you had the political will, you could skip all these feasibility studies and just do it because you would understand what you were doing. But because you've got all these politicians you have to persuade, uh, Santa Fe could be the first to get their bank set up. But now uh, a week ago, uh, John Chung, who's the treasurer in California, did a press conference where they, they've been looking into a bank to handle the cannabis money, a publicly owned bank. And that's because so cannabis is going to be legal for all purposes in January here in the state. And they're anticipating a seven billion dollar business of which one billion dollars is 
taxes or would go to taxes. So, of course, they have a financial interest in tracking that money. But also there's a, or the concern about crime that you, you have people breaking into these businesses and raiding their basements or wherever they're keeping all this cash. I mean, cash is just not a very efficient way to, to run a business. But the problem is that um, the Federal Reserve will not give them a master account. I mean, that Colorado has already gone through this for five years and they, they can't persuade the Fed to let them basically participate in the banking system, which is what a master account lets you do. So I'm not, I don't know how they're going to get around that hurdle, but they are looking closely at that and they've been working on it since February. So just that motivation might be enough to push California into it. And California is the sixth largest economy in the world. I mean, if you ask me, we should be our own country, but at the very least, we should have our own central bank or at least have our own banking system. I mean, you could, if you were desperate enough, you could set up a banking system that only happened in California. It's still a big enough place that, I mean, you probably would wind up, I suppose it would be a revolution, but, but anyway, it could be done. Or you could <laughs> There's just that little, uh, that it's, little side issue, <laughs> but, but now th that's interesting that the marijuana issue, the cannabis issue could force them to set up a central bank and the federal reserve could be forcing something. Ultimately it didn't know it was causing to happen. I mean, they would figure it out pretty quick. They're pretty bright, but they think yeah, that they're keeping well, the number, industry down. Yeah, there are a number of reasons that, um, I mean, you have little revolutions going on everywhere, not actual physical revolutions, but there are a number of reasons. The, the U.S. is really too big, I mean, to be one yes. government, because we've got different interests in different parts of the country, and that's why you have... I mean, that's really why you have political parties that are so opposed to each other. You, We just don't understand those people, whatever. Well, we all okay. have different issues. I think, yeah, you're very, exactly. I think you're right. Well, and then the media is creating a farce. Right, but, right. Yeah. Right. So I, you're not the first one I've talked to at this point that says that the United States needs to be restructured politically as well in, because we're just too big. We, we used to have representation like one to 6,000, something like that. Now it's one to a million. And it's just gotten out of hand. Yeah. Well, there are many things we could do to restructure the, <clears throat> the whole system. But again, it's a matter of political will and getting, getting our voices heard. But like for you and me, we're just out there getting information out, getting information out, planning ideas. Like this is what we could do. Well, I'm just worried that it'll get violent before we can do something smart. Because, you know, we have, I have a lot of people talking to me about the fact that they see things coming. I just don't want it to be violent. I think we could be smart and we could do some smart stuff and restructure stuff without violence. But now let's talk well, about... Okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. That's the thing. If California set up their own banking system, it would be revolutionary, but it wouldn't be a bloody revolution. It would just be fine. Uh you know, we're going <laughs> to keep our own money. We give more money to the federal government than they give back to us. So they would miss us if we <clears throat> if we pulled their money out. Well, and if you pulled your money out and you started running independently, you probably would, we would start going in other directions and things, which would probably be okay. It would be decentralizing. You know, in a business, you decentralize, push things down. Right now, we're so centralized that it's it's causing issues. But let's talk about mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies. Because, you know, the digital world is our future. And right now we have digital money, essentially. Everything is pretty much digital. But it's just a nightmare. It's like having a paper bag in the middle of your kitchen table. It's so easy to take. So we need a different crypto, you know, we need a different uh, system for doing this. And cryptocurrency seems to be at least secure in that way. Do you see this as becoming the main way to exchange funds as we go forward? Um, I, I think we're def definitely going to cryptographic uh, currency, but I don't see a private cryptocurrency replacing the dollar because it just can't. I mean, the Bitco Bitcoin can't do it. it. It's already like one one hundred thousandth of the size of M2. I mean, if you replaced if you were using it to buy a cup of coffee, even right now, you would stand in line for an hour, which is not going to work. And if you scale it up, I mean, the problem is the more people you have using it, the slower it is. 
and the more transaction fees you're going to have, it's already like $2 for a transaction fee, which you're not going to pay for a cup of coffee. And that's just for one one hundred thousandth of the money supply. What happens when you gear it up to cover everybody's personal transactions? I mean, it's perfectly good for what, what it's used for now, which is like, let's say you're in China and you want to get your money out of the country or you have a big $50,000 deal that you're doing abroad or something like that. That's good. It works for that but it's not going to replace the natu- national currency. But I think the national currency right now, people think that money is like gold. I mean, that was the idea that to get a cryptocurrency where it would be issued by the people, but it's not issued by the people. It's issued by miners who have very expensive equipment and they have very ex- you know, sophisticated knowledge that the rest of it don't have. I'm not going to be issuing any Bitcoins. There's no way I could issue a Bitcoin. It is not money issued by the people. And nor are these other, you know, there are other things that are more efficient than Bitcoin cryptocurrencies, but they too are not issued by the people. But our national currency actually is issued by the people in the sense that it is a monetization of your own promise to pay. That's where money comes from. You go to the bank and you turn your promise to pay into money. I mean, your grocer is not going to take your promise to pay but your grocer will take the bank's promise to pay. And all you have done is swap your promise to pay for theirs. I mean, what the grocer is getting is bank money. It is not Federal Reserve money. I mean, it is not money issued by the federal government. It is money issued by the bank directly. It's like originally they actually had bank notes that had their names on them individually. And then when the federal government tried to tax the bank notes, then the state banks rather than joining the federal system which is what the purpose was of this tax what they did many of the state banks was to go to checks so they would just write the number into your account when you took out a loan they didn't pay you actual bank notes like they used to do that were printed printed up that they would have to pay 10 percent tax on they would just give you a check and you basically would write your own you're writing your own bank notes on your on this checkbook which is guaranteed essentially by the bank and the bank is willing to guarantee your money because they know where to find you they uh, you may have put up some collateral they know how to garnish your wages or whatever it takes they and you're going to pay them some interest you're going to pay them a fee for this service and therefore they will guarantee your iou and that's what our money is so that could be made much safer and get the middlemen out of there and much less less manipulable with the cryptographic system. In other well, words, I think bl- that's coming. Well, and I think could block- argue- Go ahead. Well, in India, for example, they've virtually done it where they, I know it was very controversial, the fact that they demonetized, but more than, ha- well, uh, as long, well, anyway, most, most Indians couldn't get a bank account because they didn't have an ID. So like four, I think it was in 2010, they started this thing where they gave everybody an ID using um, thumbprints and eye prints. The reason they didn't have IDs was they weren't born in hospitals. They were poor people. Um, And also they have massive poor people. So, So not only do they want these people to get bank accounts in order to whatever, keep track of the money, they want people to be able to get credit like these little local vendors street vendors they would be paying 60 percent interest or whatever in typical payday lender money uh, fee rates because they didn't have a bank account and nobody knew who they were etc well now they've come up with this thing called india stack where you have all your data in your cell phone so you've got your credit history, whatever, payment history, where to find you, who you are, all those things that a bank would look at in order to give you a loan. And so these little street vendors are now getting, they can put out in the morning, they say, I need X amount of money to pay for workers and materials or whatever, you know, pay for my oranges that I'm going to sell and I'll pay you back at night. And so they can get like a one day loan on their cell phone. It might go through a bank. It might be a peer-to-peer lender that, you know, I mean, they get, it's kind of like Uber. They get all these offers on their cell phone and they say, okay, I'll take that one because that looks like the best deal. They get a, a cheap loan for the day, pay it back with the proceeds of the sale of the oranges or whatever it was. And so so you're getting micro credit that is, it's all on the cell phone. And effectively, let's say that it was borrowed from a bank. 
we know that banks do not, I mean, they're just monetizing your own credit. They are not putting up their own money. And if it's paid back at the end of the day, they don't even have to pretend to be drawing that money from somewhere else. They don't have to borrow it from their deposits or anything because they don't have to balance your books till the end of the day. So basically, they are just the guarantor guaranteeing your loan, you know, backing the thing up. So, so really, the people are creating their own credit. They can do it on the cell phone. They don't have to go into the bank. It's all digitalized. So it does seem to me that one day, banking will just be so any, like anything else you do on the Internet or like you do on your cell phone. You don't need these middleman manipulators that, I mean, you would still, I think, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> So anyway, you, you you might need bankers for some functions. I mean, it's kind of cold to say that it's all based on smart contracts. What if the smart contract says you can get it under the, you know, you can get credit if you qualify in this way. But what if you really should have qualified? I mean, if your local banker knew you personally and knew your family and knew you were good for it, they might give you a loan. And so for that sort of thing, you still need the personal touch. It's not like we want to get all the people out of the system. Well, but, if we did that, it'd turn into a technocracy nightmare, right? I mean, yeah. it turn in, it w- it would turn into a nightmare. But yet, we want the we have to figure out how to balance out technology with people. Otherwise, we're right. Yeah. Right. Uh, yes. So now, now that the Indians, because it was a change, and so people just you know, anytime you do a change, there's chaos and people fighting, and the big guys are taking over, and we hate you and everything else. But now that it's implemented, are people liking it over in India? Well, they reelected that government, the, uh, the Modi government. So that was taken as a vote of confidence in, in this system. They re- I think it was March when the election was, and uh, that they uh, demonetized in November. But they didn't need to demonetize. They shouldn't have demonetized. Many people, critics there at the time, said it was a bad idea. And Modi himself was very ambivalent about it. And it did create chaos. But, the, you know, one good thing is it created a lot more bank accounts because a lot of people did turn their, I mean, I think I read that 97% of, the, of this cash did come into the banks. I mean, there was many inefficiencies. The ATMs weren't set up right for the new bills. And, you know, people did suffer. But you have to, I understand. You have to understand the Indian mentality. They have been desperately poor since the 1940s. I mean, there was a massive, massive famine right when they became a country. So they nationalized something like 70 percent of the banks. I think it was Indira Gandhi nationalized the banks. I mean, she forced the 14 largest banks to be nationalized, not because they were bankrupt. Like, you know, we, we might nationalize our banks in another 2008 situation. That was a discussion in 2008, whether we should nationalize the banks. But it was because they weren't serving the poor, poor properly. I mean, can you imagine our, you know, can you imagine Trump, uh, President Trump saying, well, the banks aren't serving the people properly, so we're going to nationalize them and just doing it. But it, Indira Gandhi could get away with it. I mean, that's, that's the way their system is. And that's, People accepted that, and they still accept it. And they, they still. I mean, I heard, I saw interviews of people on the street, and they said, "Well, it was a bit painful and all that, but you know, it's all for the good." I mean, they they bought the the party line, I guess that it that it was a good thing. I mean, I think it was a bad thing. I don't think they should have demonetized. But anyway, there is no reason for us to demonetize. We already have ninety five percent digital currency. And we need that other 5%. What happens when the computers go down? What happens when your cell phone battery dies or whatever? You you want some backup. You need some gold for backup. You need whatever. You need Bitcoin, if assuming your cell phone still works (laughs) or, you know, assuming you still have the Internet. So so I think we're and we'd have a revolution if they tried to demonetize. Yeah, they're not going to mess around doing that. Here. No, they might take yeah. away. They did take away the, some big bills, and I don't think anybody really noticed. But well, I mean, yeah, no one talked people. about it. The alternative media didn't talk about it, so nobody really noticed. I guess the. Yeah. I the, mean, like if you take away the ten thousand dollar bill, ordinary people aren't really going to notice because no. we don't have any ten thousand dollar. Yeah, well, no, <laughs> unfortunately, no. So, yeah. so getting back to the concept of technocracy. The idea that 
you know, where everything gets so um, automated that it becomes a nightmare because now you don't, you all get put into, I always call it the McDonald's drive through you know, where nobody, you don't fit the process, but you get crammed through it and it doesn't work for you. How do you see us making sure that doesn't happen? Well, that is a very good question, um, but that's why I say for, for you still want to keep your local friendly banker or, you know, you still want to keep people in there. In fact, I read somewhere that it's it's not true that all, all the jobs can be monet, uh, automated because ma- machines will break down. You need human beings monitoring the machines. Yeah, but we so, don't want just the mechanics working. We need the 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 people where the machines can't make the logical decisions and where it's more of an art, we need people doing it. Right, right. Yeah. But um, whether that'll happen, who knows? I mean, I think there is actually a big push to turn us into machines, like to actually control our minds. I mean, if you want to go back to Sumeria and, and Lilaninki, eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that was uh, it, more, you know, having a moral judgment that there, there was one side of this division between whatever that wanted us to not have moral judgment, that wanted us to just be machines that would be workers and shoot people when on demand without having any feeling about it. So whether they can do that, they may be able to do it. They may be doing that right now with chemtrails. Who knows? Oh, I hope not. I don't want to be part of the machine. I would, I, I'm the one that will shut down and, and not work anymore. <laughs> right? Yeah. We're already pulling out. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's certain, there's certain ones of us that have already rejected a certain amount of that control. And we always have to be on, you know, looking at it from a <laughs> high view of what the system's doing. I, otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about all this stuff all the time. And all the listeners are more like that, too, because they wouldn't be trying to learn about all this stuff all the time. But, okay, let's talk about the current political climate, because it is strange right now. And I want to see what you think of what's really going on. Do you think that our government is starting to be cleaned up, or do you think it's almost like two gangs fighting? Uh, both. Uh, well... I don't know. I mean, I think there was an intent to clean it up, but whether they're pulling it off, who knows. But it, I do think those 800 um, sealed indictments are promising. It's it's certain, As a writer, it's an extremely interesting time to be alive. There is so much to explore and write about. Well, I'm excited about those indictments. I can't, I mean, I... You know, I get goosebumps thinking about what that could be because I've been covering some pretty hard topics for a good couple of years. And I, so when I hear this, I'm like, oh, I just hope, <laughs> you know, because we have so many issues and we can't even, the things that we're talking about here, those things won't get cleaned up and we won't be able to get onto a better road until we get rid of that base corruption. I mean, like Catherine Austin Fitz is talking about that 41 trillion, or I think that's the number you said. We're not going to be able to touch any of that with corruption being completely everywhere. There's no way. Yeah, right. <clears throat> Agreed. Okay, so let's wrap this up. How can people learn more about you? I think you have a book coming out. You have a boatload of other books that you've written that, you know, some are national bestsellers and all sorts of things. So, Where can people learn more about you? When is your book coming out? And tell us about yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, My websites are ellenbrown.com and publicbankinginstitute.org, which is not my website, but that's my organization. I'm chairman. And um, I have 12 books all available on Amazon, (laughs) among other places. my two on banking are Web of Debt and the Public Bank Solution. The one I'm working on is called The Coming Revolution in Banking, uh, Democratizing Money in the Digital Age, where I talk a lot about cryptocurrencies and how we could fix the system, basically, and why, why basically why regulation won't work. The things they're trying to do aren't going to work, that so we have to have a different fix, and then I propose what I think is the different fix. And my first 10 books were on alternative health care and basically the the medical pharmaceutical cartel. 
when do you expect that book to come out? Well, I expect to be done in like two more weeks, but then there's all those things that you have to go through to get it published. So, so when you when that book comes out, I want to talk to you again because I want to really dive into the cryptocurrencies because it's a hot topic. We have all these big. I called the Bitcoin people a cult <laughs> because it's kind of weird. I um I've been talking to um Kels Wilson, who was actually the first one to um patent and use blockchain. He came up with blockchain independently and patent and use it um, in an application. First one to do it in the world. And his version of blockchain actually can scale. It's He has a whole bunch of different things that he does with it. And um, so it really could be a useful product for cryptocurrencies, although he's not as interested in cryptocurrencies. He does it for more um, preventing fraud in documents and things. But I think it could be used. Um, so once that really, once you put that book out, I'd really like to bring you back if you're okay with that. Okay. That'd be great. Thanks, Derek. Yeah. Thank you so much.